So the title is, what happens if your child is diagnosed with a rare disease? And um, I think this is a question that can't be answered because it entirely depends on the rare disease, right? Um, rare diseases are very different, so um, hard to answer. So we need a showcase and um, the example I would like to give is the Pura syndrome for reasons that have been mentioned already. We uh, ran into this disease and we're tightly connected with the uh, Pura syndrome foundation since then. And so I think it's, it's, uh, it's a story I want to tell you about um, how people came together for something better. So what we'll be, talk we'll be talking about today? Oh, mainly it's about pure patients, pure syndrome patients. That's the, the topic. Uh, um, and I think before we go into this, we should clarify what actually a rare disease is, right? How is it defined and uh, what, what is the majority of causes uh, for these diseases? And secondly, well, what happens to families with rare disease diagnosis? Um, and this is something I, I can't really explain on, on my own experience, uh, but I will try to convey to you what uh, your families have told me, you know, what, what the, the first reactions were and then how this evolved. And then of course, there's the other side, um, us researchers, and um, I want to explain to you, well, how it felt from our side that we all of a sudden ran into such a rare disease and we were faced with lots of new questions. And then of course, the, the most important question is, uh, well, you know, what happens? What are the opportunities and joint benefits for, bo for both sides if one uh, cooperates? So that's the agenda. Let's start with the first one. What is a rare disease? Well, it certainly sounds like something you're not affected, right? Um, at least for the ones that don't know somebody, it seems to be far away. Um, and actually, when we look at the definition of a rare disease, I think that makes sense. Um, the EU definition is um, it should affect less than one in 2,000 people. And um, the US definition is much stricter, actually. It's one in 200,000 people. So, um, well, that sounds far away. On the other hand, yeah, and, and that's a, a graphical representation of what I just told you. If you have like 2,000 squares, a, a single square would be the person with a rare disease. So it's really rare. On the other hand, um, there's not just one rare disease, right? There are several of them. Um, and people estimate that there are at least eight to 10,000 different rare diseases. And that sums up to three to 400 million patients worldwide. That sounds a bit more, right? So that means actually one in 20 people is affected by a rare disease. And that means rare diseases are common. They're not you know, rare, but they're very common. It's just they're subdivided into several uh, different uh, rare diseases. So that's the first key message I want to convey here. You know, um, you, everybody of you should know somebody who has a rare disease. Even you, if you're not aware of that, um, you should probably, you probably know somebody. So what is the cause for rare disease? In most of the cases, it's a genetic cause. Um, and I want to show you in a very brief summary what, what goes wrong there and how a genetic disease is actually developing. So just consider human cells, you know, it uh, has an envelope, um, a membrane, and we have a nucleus. Um, there's also a membrane encapsulated entity, and there in the nucleus, we have our chromosomes. So this is where our genes are in. Um, genes are in the nucleus, and they are construction plans. Um, there's construction plans for molecular machines. So these molecular machines, we biologists call proteins. Um, and that means if the construction plan is wrong, the machine won't work, right? Makes sense. Good thing about this construction plan is you can just, just not make one machine, but you can make several machines that, you know, then work in the cell. So that's the normal status. If we get a rare disease, if we get a disease, something in the construction plan has changed. Um, and um, the problem there is to identify this mistake in the construction plan, because we not only have one gene, we have several of them. And if we would print all the genes on the chromosomes, everything that is uh, in our genome and make books out of it, it would be an entire bookshelf, as you can see here from the Wellcome collection. So this is a printed version of an entire genome. And well, our gene, our Pura gene would be in a single book of those on a single page um, here written down. 
and mistake a mutation that causes the disease can be as little as a change in a single letter of uh, this gene. So I think it becomes quite easy, the, uh, comprehensible why it's so difficult to identify rare diseases. Um, we got much better with sequencing and so on, and uh, there are automated algorithms who can really identify those things. Um, but the initial discovery that a certain gene is responsible for a certain gene is, is really uh, difficult. And uh, so it took also a while for Pura until we, we made the connection, right? Um, so in Pura, it means a mutated Pura gene results in a broken Pura protein machine. And it's the broken protein machine that probably causes the problem, not the gene itself. All right, so much about the introduction on what a rare disease is and what uh, yeah, the molecular mechanism of such a, a problem is. So let's go to the second question. What happens to families with rare disease diagnosis? Um, first of all, I think people with rare diseases, with rare genetic diseases, are victims of evolution. Um, because mutations are the motor of evolution. You know? We have a certain amount of mutations that are occurring by every new generation. Um, this has been measured 50 to 60, 70 mutations with every newborn life. And in most of the cases, perhaps nothing happens. They hit a place, they change a place that is not important. In some cases, um, it affects a gene that is important and you get a disease, um, like with Apura syndrome. Uh, and, and, and in very few cases, this mutation, this change in the gene um, has a benefit. And that is the driving force behind evolution. Mm -hmm. And so what we see is actually the side effect of evolution. But that also means that um, one of these naturally occurring mutations has actually hit the Pura, uh, the Pura gene and probably destroyed the protein's function, right? Um, so that's, that's the basis, which also means that um, you can't do anything about it, meaning you are not responsible for it. That's the good news. Um, but um, you, know, you couldn't have avoided it, let's say like that. So what is, the, what is the normal thing that people first see when they get the diagnosis? It's, 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 a le it's actually a letter from uh, your doctor. And that typically looks like that. Um, Try to read it um, and uh, you will be confused, I'm sure, unless you, you have seen such a letter before. Um, so this is what doctors usually hand over to you. And if you have a good doctor, a, a caring doctor, will try to explain to you uh, what that means and try to help you to, to put that into perspective. But it often also happens that, you know, you just get this letter and are told, well, there's nothing you can do, um, goodbye. That's, that's the worst of the possible cases. Um, the most important things are those here. Um, so in the text, you have all the important information and they're summarized here again in this table. First of all, the affected gene is the Pura gene. Secondly, in this case, the highly shortened protein is unlikely to be functional. So it's a loss of function mutation. So the protein machine is broken. And then um, at least as important is here the statement, the unaffected mother and father, meaning they don't have symptoms, do not have these genomic alterations. So that means um, in normal cases, um, the, the parents don't have that mutation. There are special cases uh, of mosaicism, um, which I will not talk about, but that's the basic information you're, you're ending up with. And then, you know, you go home and um, start to wonder. Lots of questions come up. First of all, of course, what the heck is Pura? Uh, you have no idea. Other questions, what now? What should I do? Did I do something wrong? And you, the clear answer is no. As I said, you know, it's a random mutation that um, by chance hit the genome of your child. Um, why me and why child? Um, this is an answer you can't answer, right? A question you can't answer because as I said, it's a, it's a random event, right? But then you start to be more focused. That's what I imagine at least. Um, and you start to search for help. You know, is there any help out there? Um, and of course, this is connected to the question what does all this mean for my child? And what's the usual thing you do when you have questions and don't have answers? You go to the internet, right? Let's check the internet. So in 2014, when this disease was discovered, first described, there was nothing out there. You searched the internet and there was nothing, absolutely nothing. Um, desert. 
This was the first thing they noticed and uh, affected families also realized we'll be a, a long windy road, you know, until we end up somewhere that is hopefully better than, uh, than the starting point. And, um, and I think that was a, an important moment uh, where people realized that families realized, uh, you know, there's nothing out there, this is not good, and this should not be like this. Um, so they wanted to change it. So the first families came together and they made the decision that they want to make it a better place for poor patients. And um, as you see, um, there's lots of energy in there. And this is actually what I experienced when I first met poor families. Um, so much energy, so much power, so much of uh, curiosity um, and, and drive to, to change things. And that's actually a, a, major part of, a major part of what I want to convey to you. Um, these families are really exciting, um, also in particular for scientists uh, who all of a sudden realize, wow, this is the other side. I think this is a good moment to drink some beer, right? So cheers to everybody or alcohol-free beer. Okay, so the outcome. The outcome is a foundation. That's what they ended up with. Um, it's called Poor Syndrome Foundation. Makes sense, right? It was officially established in 2016. And you have to imagine that in 2014, these families were first informed that, you know, their child has Pura syndrome. Nothing out there, nothing known. And they came together. And in 2016, they had all the paperwork together to be established as a nonprofit organization. And amongst the goals they had was, um, of course, first of all, connect affected families. You know, um, meet other families, talk, exchange, find out how other families are doing, what their problems are. Is it the same? Is it different? And so on. And of course, then collect information about you know, how to support uh, the patients. And if there's any therapeutic approaches out there, um, yeah, make a, a knowledge base. And then in addition, foster research on Pura syndrome. And I want to mention David Hunt and Diana Burrell, who were uh, amongst the first people, uh, yeah, who actually, these are, were the people who actually discovered the disorder and they were supporting the foundation from onset. There were more people, um, and I'll just mention these two names on behalf. I think without them, it, it would have been more difficult perhaps for, for the families to, to establish that. Okay, and this is already the, the first example of how good and important it is to join forces between effective families and, uh, and scientists. So we have a website now, um, you can search that and you'll find resources there, you know, about the syndrome, about information for families, uh, upcoming events, also a research page where it summarized what we're doing and so on and so on. Okay, but let's continue and say something about what Pura syndrome actually is. Um, it's a great, great pleasure to be told today that, uh, this morning actually, that we have now 401 patients. So the 400 mark was just, uh, um, yeah, broken today. Um, and th I think this is quite great. Um, also something which is funny for people who don't deal with rare diseases that uh, you're happy to have more people, right, with a rare disease. Um, it simply means the family is growing, it's getting bigger, and the patients are there out there anyways, right? The, the families uh, have the diseased kids and um, if they don't know what the disease is, um, one can't help them. So the bigger the number, uh, the, the greater the, the potential um, or the, the implications you can have, the better, the better you can help the families. So that's why, um, yeah, the Pura Foundation goes on, on hunting down new patients because they realize it's, you can better help people if they know what it is. Um, the syndrome itself, you see, is uh, having, it's, it's consisting of a number of different um, difficulties, abnormalities. Um, the unifying um, um, this, uh, symptoms are certainly um, moderate to severe uh, um, mental retardation and hypotonia. Hypotonia means uh, that people can't use the muscle with full strength. So they have floppy movements and so on. So that's something that is... Um, yeah, almost found in all uh, the poor patients. But it's, these are also symptoms that you find in a number of other disorders that are uh, called neurodevelopmental disorders. All right, and um, also important to mention, it's not those things that are most difficult for most for several families. It's the epileptic seizures um, 
that actually is, is, is over and over again as stated as, as the most difficult uh, thing for families because uh, this really hurts the kids and uh, there's no, no good way of, way of treating, them, uh, treating it. And that's certainly something uh, research is aiming at. Okay, so this was the family side. Now we come to the researchers, which includes myself. So now I can talk about myself. Um, so it was a while ago um, when I was working on Pura protein and, you know, we're doing, we're doing basic research. There was a mouse model available, but um, there was nothing known about families with uh, this disorder. And so, you know, I was in the lab, had uh, my first bottle of uh, sparkling wine already uh, uh, in this and was waiting for the second one to open. Um, <laughs> and was thinking about the next great experiment when an email hit me. Um, this was an email by David Hunt, one of the, uh, he was the first author, author of one of the two papers that initially described the poor syndrome. And uh, I just tried to recapitulate what he was writing. Um, and so he said, Dear Dr. Dirk, uh, Dr. Niesing, UK based, based uh, geneticist working on poor patients. You know, a group of families affected by poor syndrome are organizing a conference in London. I said, oh, interesting. Um, would like to invite you, okay, have no funding, okay, but we would be grateful if you decide to join us anyways. Um, and this was kind of, a, yeah, an exciting moment. Um, and so I got nervous, quite nervous because, you asked why, because I'm not a med medical doctor, right? So I'm not prof professionally trained to see patients, right? So I didn't know what to expect. And what I thought what I would be facing uh, was that, you know, there's a, uh, this might be a sad event because they're all the families that uh, have children with affected, uh, and, uh, yeah, with, with a ch a children with, uh, with a severe disorder. And uh, so I wasn't really sure um, what, what that would be, but I felt that, you know, I should go there, I have to go there. And of course, as a scientist, I was also curious. And so I went to London to the conference and made some interesting observations. So first of all, Surprisingly, it was a party. People were so happy there. They were so few, so cheerful. Um, I was not sure if I was in the right place at the beginning, you know, um, uh, until somebody uh, you know, pulled me aside and said, well, are you the missing doctor? I said, probably yes. <laughs> and so uh, we got into contact and uh, yeah, I really enjoyed being there. What I also observed there is um, that, yeah, one of the main reasons was that families were really happy to meet other affected families. You could exchange, you know, you could see what, uh, what their issues are. You could talk about uh, what, what did you do to, to prevent this, to, to uh, overcome this and that problem and so on. Second thing was, um, you know, they were actually happy to finally know the cause of the disorder. And I will have to talk about that in a second. And, of course, they also had to acknowledge that this is not a disease that can be treated really, um, at least not the cause of the uh, disorder. Symptoms, of course, to some extent, but not the, uh, the cause, at least not at this point. You know, with gene therapy at the horizon, who knows what, what will come up in the next couple of years, but for now, this is not possible. Um, and so this is something, this is an aspect I, I would like to point out a little bit more because this is actually something that, that took me a while to understand. Um, just imagine you have a newborn child and you don't get a correct um, um, diagnosis. So some you know, doctor says it's this disease, then you go to the next one, say, tells you it's another disorder um, and everybody has a different opinion. Um, and so what happens is that you go to doctor to, from doctor to doctor and what I call the di diagnostic burden gets bigger and bigger. So you're testing, 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 always thinking that if I don't do enough testing and um, I'm not continuing to search, you know, um, there's perhaps the one thing that the easy solution that would help my child and I would miss out on it. Um, so this puts a lot of pressure on these families and the longer it takes, you know, the heavier this diagnostic burden is. And actually, in average, it takes about, uh, let's say, a, a five to eight years, this is at least what literature says, until a rare disease gets diagnosed. But if, you know, if there is no, no known cause for, for this disease, before Pura syndrome, for instance, had been described, there was no chance, no possibility to make a final di diagnosis. 
And so these people, many of these people had years of, uh, yeah, um, diagnostic marath marathons behind them and they were really happy that they finally knew what was going on, right? So this way it really makes sense. All right, so this brings me to, why is it not moving? Yep, why? Uh, to the next to the last point, which is the opportunities and joint benefits for both sides, patients and researchers. And I was looking on the internet and uh, collecting pictures and uh, put, was putting them all on, onto one slide, just to, as a dummy slide, and realized then one, once I had all the pictures there that this actually describes the, well, the, the initial benefit quite well. When you look at that, it re looks really happy. Yeah? Um, and uh, that's actually what it is. Um, so you have all the kids, you have a meeting here, Cambridge 2018, we had one in Boston 2019. Um, you see here the research together with uh, uh, the board member John Erickson here. Um, so it's every time it's really, really nice, and very enjoyable uh, to meet these families, to interact with them. And it's a mutual thing. So I think um, on a personal side, it's, it's really, really rewarding. So that's the first thing. Um, then on, on a, from a more professional perspective, uh, we came together as scientists to build up a research network. Um, so we have groups in North America and Europe, UK, um, but also Australia who all contribute um, to, you know, to, to the knowledge of uh, the Pura syndrome. We're all collecting data, we all do experiments, we meet um, and, and try to, to shape a research plan uh, that, that would you know, help to understand what goes wrong in these children and to, to understand uh, how one could treat these kids to uh, reduce the symptoms, let's say like that. In addition, we have regular meetings. This is organized by the Pura Syndrome Foundation and uh, we researchers co-organize that. We hold meetings there, we hold uh, talks there explaining you know, pretty much what I do now. What is a gene? Why is a mutation in the gene affecting a protein? What, you know, what could be the causes? What could be consequences? And so on and so on. And we have them alternating in North America uh, or in Europe. Um, and uh, this is something that is also very nice because uh, families European families can easier travel here and US families, of course, like to go more to the US. Um, in addition, we have um, the board. Um, this is um, uh, Dominic Spatterfor. He is actually the president of this foundation. And this is Mel Anderson. Uh, she was our scientific liaison at that time. And you see Mel was flying in from uh, Australia and Dom was flying in from uh, from the US and we all met October at Oktoberfest. And um, I think it, it shows that again, that this is really uh, great fun. Of course, we also did some work there, some serious work, but I think the empty glass of Dominic shows you very nicely that uh, Pura Syndrome Foundation is definitely compatible with Pint of Science, right? So good choice, Monica. Good, so what's the research plan? Um, we try to have a blend of different um, technologies and, and methods. Um, of course, clinical research is really, really important. Um, working with patients, seeing what's going on there, but you can't do experiments and you don't want to do experiments with um, patients, right? So that's what animal models are good for. There you can mutate genes, you can um, change things um, in the genome and you can um, challenge these mice and so on. Um, so we have different animal models. Um, we have a frog, we have mouse, we have a fish model. Um, and we try to understand what, what the effect of pro on the organism is. Then we have cell biology. Um, I mentioned a little bit on that, um, where we look into cells and see what's, what's happening there. And what I call structural biochemistry, we also look at Pura and try to see how it looks like to understand uh, what's, uh, what's, what's going wrong in these mutations. So we put all this together for a greater knowledge base. It's all put together into the Pura network and we have established, and that's again uh, the work from uh, Diana uh, Barrao in the UK, um, have established a patient registry where all patient information are systematically put together. So, you know, it's not, uh, um, sharing stories in individual cases, but you can really make statistics on what works with families, what does not work, um, what is the, you know, what, which treatment, treatment works, which not. 
and there's a biobank being established in Munich. And the idea is that we will understand how Pura works and means we have a mechanistic understanding and then we can approach therapy. So in other words, the logic is if we understand why patients develop symptoms, uh, efficient therapies can be developed. That's our hope, that's our mission statement. In addition, I want to reiterate that um, gene replacement therapy or gene therapy is currently out of reach. I mean, this is something we, we have in the discussions when we uh, meet with families and, you know, this is something that goes through media and is being highly promoted, um, but there are a number of, of severe hurdles um, for Pura. Uh, we can talk about that later. Um, that prevents at this point uh, that uh, gene therapy should be, should be applied. No? Okay, um, before coming to the end, I uh, just want to briefly mention two examples from our research. Um, first one is uh, that we want to understand Pura, function of Pura by observing how it works at atomic scale. This means we really look at the molecule, at the molecular machine. And the idea is if you see how a molecular machine works, then you understand what happens if it breaks, right? And so we use so-called X-ray crystallography to see the pro protein, and it's kind of a, like a microscope. Um, it's called synchrotron, a big machine, as you can see, where we go there and measure our data. And the outcome is something like that. So that's a structure you see here in, in, uh, in blue, the natural protein that is not affected. And you see in, uh, in black and in purple, um, a protein that has a pura mutation. And you can see that, for instance, this part here uh, has shifted from here to here. So it's, uh, yeah, it's this arrangement you can see here. So we understand what, what's going on wrong there, you know. Uh, we can see why the protein doesn't function anymore. So that's the first one. And the second um, thing I want to share with you is, uh, and it's on the other end of the scale, let's say uh, like that, is that we want to use induced, or we are using induced pluripotent stem cells, so-called IPS cells, to understand what function Pura has in cells. And uh, the way this works is you have a Pura syndrome patient, you do a little sk a skin biopsy, this means a little skin punch of three to four millimeters, and from which you can grow skin cells. And then you can convince these skin cells to forget what they were and make them naive again. Um, oh, and I should mention that these, it's important, these are not embryonic stem cells. Uh, let's see if I get that again. Yeah, um, these are really skin cells. So we can't make an embryo out of that. So this is ethically, uh, you know, not a difficult thing to work with. Um, so we can use these skin cells and we can convince them to become stem cells again, meaning naive, they forget who they were and you can convince them to become other types of cells, different, obtain different sulfates. So neural cells, you can make muscle cells out of them, you can even make uh, bone cells out of them. And the idea is that we take these cells, uh, grow them, have them differentiate, and then we compare patient cells with healthy cells. And the differences between both will tell us about you know, which cellular functions are not okay and which molecular pathways are affected. And this is something we really need to understand uh, when, we want, when we think about therapies. All right, so with this, I'm, I'm done. Actually, um, I just want to mention again uh, that you, the Pura family really has uh, conquered the lab. Um, um, everybody is somehow involved, even if they have projects that are unrelated. Monica, for instance, is not working on Pura but for some reason I still thought that I should be talking about it. We have people working on other projects who make, who translated flyers into different con uh, languages and so on. So everybody is helping. And I think this, this sh nicely shows the great impact uh, the, the Pura Foundation and the families have on us as researchers. And so we're really grateful for that interaction, for this being together and, and for this uh, journey we have started together. If you have questions further, uh, questions, want to support, want to donate, whatever, um, you find more information on this website. With this, I'm done. I hope you uh, got something out of this and enjoyed the talk. Um, and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you very much.